King David Sukkah, no. we're going to get a rebuilt soon? What's going on with that? Only because we say something during benching or during the Amidah, that doesn't mean that it creates a spiritual reality. But there's a lot of things we say. For example, in the first bracha, we mentioned the resurrection of the dead of the Amidah. This is a bracha written by the rabbis who believed in this stuff, but that doesn't mean that because there's a mystical concept mentioned in the Amidah that it's a principle of our faith. Even though the Rambam does believe it's a principle, it's not in the Torah. Because it's metaphysical, it has to appear in the Torah for it to be binding or obligatory for someone to believe. That's another way of saying that the line of David will be reestablished, that David will be king again. Some people, I've, I've met a few people who believe that that means that it's Mamish King David who's going to come back, not just someone from his line. It's funny, the Torah doesn't specifically say in a clear fashion that the kingship has to come from David. This is the way the Rambam understood it. He believed that anyone from any tribe could be king with the exception of, now this is also not in the Torah, that converts can't be kings. When it says that you shall pick someone from amongst your brothers, it doesn't literally mean from amongst your brothers. It just means like don't make an Ammonite or Amorite or like someone from Amalek your king. It means someone in Israel, whether you're a convert or not. But the rabbis understood it to mean that it had to be a born Jew. Fine. Anyone who's an Israelite could be king. But to be Mashiach, you have to be from the line of David. So that already creates a different category because the notion of the Messiah doesn't literally appear in the Torah. There's kingship, and then there's really, that's it. The Rambam kind of mixes them together. He says that the command to believe in Mashiach is the command to establish a regular king. So it's almost a contradiction. If the command to believe in Mashiach is Deuteronomy chapter 17, the end of chapter 17, then how can you say that anyone could be king, but only someone from Shevet Yehuda through David has to be Mashiach? These guys don't always make so much sense, but this is why I'm not so big on what the notion of Mashiach has become, because it's clearly not what the Torah speaks about. Again, the Torah doesn't speak about even kings being anointed. Mashiach, to anoint, right? kings aren't anointed. They are anointed according to the rabbis. The rabbis also, the judges, anointed priests, kings, and the, uh, priests. The utensils, the utensils are anointed in the Torah according to the Torah. Yeah, right. objects are the anointed Mashiach, yeah. But if you talk about people, yeah, the priests and the king, yeah. Kings. So priests and Caleb, like, and that's it. And then everything else was instituted by the rabbis or by the judges. The outside chat, chat. The, no Chatty Cathy's is even, but I do have a follow-up sort of, I know this is kind of hateful and, and it's not really fits my personality, but this this mass suicide at Masad, right? What's, what's it called? Masada. Um, Masada. Um wouldn't it have been better, though, for them to stand and fight and, and to die in battle than to than to just kill themselves? I mean, it just doesn't seem like, you know, giving up. It seems to me like almost giving up. I mean, you're trying to say, okay, well, you know, they would have been desecrated if they stayed alive, but wouldn't it have been better to just kill at least one Roman Edomite than just to not kill any? From a tactical perspective, yeah. And I see both as futile. If you know you're outnumbered and you're going to be decimated and tortured and be forced to give out other positions, isn't that also a form of suicide than saying, like, you know what, that we're not going to give these people the benefit of the doubt and we're just going to what, jump off this cliff? There was two incidents. There was one that they drew lots and one man put another man to death and vice versa. So there was one left and there was another one that they jumped off a cliff or something like that. I see both as not a desecration of God's name, but when it's done within reason, it could be a good thing. It's just nowadays, there's a huge dumbification of the Jewish world that we just start writing everything off like if Judaism was created 500 years ago, because these are the only sources they bring down. I acknowledge that rabbis 500 years ago, 600 years ago, wrote against this. Where they prohibited a lot of things just because they thought they knew better, but not because it literally appears in the Talmud. I have a video about cremation. Nowhere in the Talmud, nowhere in the Torah does it prohibit cremation. Now, the law is that someone has to be buried bekarcha, where they have to be buried in the ground. But if someone's cremated, and there was a few instances like this in the Holocaust that they had ashes and they buried the ashes. And it still fulfilled the mitzvah of kavura, of burying a dead body. So I don't know where rabbis nowadays could look someone in the eye and say the Torah teaches and say that cremation is prohibited. It, the Torah doesn't teach it, and the, the rabbis don't teach it. And when I say the rabbis, I mean the rabbis in the Talmud. So you should say that we prohibit it, or it's our custom not to do it. And I agree. I agree. 
It's things that nations did. I guess you could consider it you know, hukas akum or like darche mori, like the ways of the Gentiles or the ways of the Amorites. These are the statements that appear in the Talmud for things that Gentiles would do. I understand that. But people get away with saying Judaism teaches or the Torah teaches and spewing nonsense. They get away with that too much. And when I hear other rabbis just sit idly by and say, hey, guy, let's be accurate. Let's stop dumbing down our audience and assuming that they're complete fools. They may be fools, okay, but they don't have to remain fools. At least tonight, during their speech, they could come out a little bit smarter. But the reason they say stuff like this is because they don't want to be challenged. They're like, I don't want to have to explain this to you guys. So just assume everything I say is like Moses said it. And this is how it's taught. Many of them teach that the words of the Godoylem nowadays is like if it was given on Moses on Mount Sinai. I mean, they teach us. They teach us the words. The Sikhs of the Labavitch Rebbe were given on Mount Sinai as well because it's a huge dumbification. Wow. Nobody comes. I would love to be a part of these stump the rabbi classes or whatever where people make these statements. And no, of course, it's easy to make a statement where no one questions. People come in this show and basically call me idiot and question me. And it's fine. That's what I want. I want that dialogue. I'm like addicted to the dialogue. That's what sharpens me to debate. I want to be put in a corner where I have to take a step back and see what I really know or honestly say, I don't know. I'll learn. It's all about distinctions. Always make a distinction. Like most of the stuff is not ethical stuff. And no one's arguing it's okay to rape and murder. It's things that happen in life, like cremation, whether you cremate someone or you bury them is not an ethical issue. It could be infringing on a ceremonial one. It could be you emulating an idolatrous practice. I mean, the Vikings used to burn people, fine. But it's not an ethical issue. If you make people lose faith because of the ceremonial, they're not going to stay long enough to hear the ethical. So this is why, just give people the truth, even though it makes Judaism seem not as sophisticated. Because some people want to be told what to do every moment of their life. And I've had people tell me, Asher, the bare bones Judaism you're presenting me doesn't answer all my questions. And I'm telling you, that's the answer that you should be seeking. Someone who doesn't answer all your questions, someone that gives you the ability to use your own brain in areas that are gray. Someone who gives you the ability to use your own brains and put what you've learned into practice. There's so many areas that we could decide for ourselves if it's allowed and it's not allowed because it's not mentioned in the Torah or in the Talmud. But even in those areas, you want a rabbi to tell you what to do. I mean, come on, guys. This is one of the main reasons I'm not a Christian. This is one of the main reasons I'm not a Muslim. Even in areas of the metaphysical, Satan, heaven, hell, all that is answered for you in Christianity. And I'm like, where'd they get it from? I mean, it's not in the Torah. It's right. not in Tanakh. Where did they get it from? Well, they made it up. But to be honest, they didn't make it up. They took it from rabbinical stories and legends, what we call Midrashim and Agadot. For sure. Okay, fine. At least in the Jewish world, we could say, that's a Midrash, that's Agadah. And then we could leave it like that and say that it doesn't affect the way I view God or I view the world. But a Christian can't say that. A Christian has to be like, it's in the New Testament. It's the word of God. Even though Paul's in jail, throwing shout outs to his friends, say hi to John, say hi to Carla. But this is the word of God to them. But yes, it covers a lot more, but that's not a good thing. Being told not to use your God-given senses is not a good thing. God wants you to use your own common sense to deal with your problems because that's going to help you become a better person and teach your son on how to make better decisions. You can't really just rely on the advice that people want to give you. This is why this whole notion that you can understand the Torah without commentators. The commentators is like Torah. Here, first of all, by the simple fact that commentators contradict each other on what a Pusik is trying to tell you, is not trying to tell you that there's 70 faces of the Torah. It means that no one knows exactly what this Pusik means. And just how Rashi comments and the Ibn Ezra and the Rashbam comment, you can also comment too. And assuming that you understand the Hebrew properly, you could also write your own commentary and bring other ideas to the table. Why not? Why not? Now, what you can do is call your own commentary Torah like they do with their commentaries because none of it is Torah. Torah is Torah, and there's commentaries to the Torah. And if you don't like a commentary, you can say, I don't like that commentary. Are you saying you know more than Rashi? Are you saying you know more than the Rashbam? This is a stupid argument. You don't have to know more than someone to disagree with a person. Because there's other rabbis who also disagree with them. What game are you playing here? You could just agree more with the Rambam than you agree with Rashi. Like if you want to play within the rules of your arena. I, I came across that this week also. I was studying the, the uh, parsha for Korach. He rebelled against Moses. 
And it wasn't just the fact that he was uh, rebellion, uh, rebelling. It was it was an internal uh, motive, which was like a a bad heart. Uh, because I kind of like Korak's idea where he says, to, uh, "Are aren't we all aren't we all uh, children of God?" He asks. But that aside, he's he's rebelling against the priesthood. So I was looking up information about his Korak's rebellion. And it said somewhere in the Ethics of the Fathers about the uh, an argument for the sake of heaven will continue. In other words, like what you're saying, it just keeps going on with the uh, the, the conflict. I hate to call it conflict, but but the uh, the back and forth. What is the right position? What is the right position? And uh, contrast that with an argument which is really simply against God. It's just going to die out. It's not going to continue. A good kosher dialogue. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's interesting. Korak, wh what's your opinion on Korak? Because I've heard, I've been doing a little study of, of uh, Korak, and, and it, it seems that I, it even says in the Torah that Moses actually said to him, his response was, oh, yeah, bring incense to the Holy of Holies if you want to do such a thing. Um, so it's like Moses is actually encouraging to rebel, I thought, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Sort of what, what exactly do you make of that? Is it like maybe it's like teaching him a lesson? Like if you put the hand on the stove when it's hot, you're going to burn yourself sort of lesson or is it something else? All the Torah tells us is Korach bad, Moses good. That's it. Now, clearly. <laughs> well, not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> I think all around the earth swallowed think, him up. <laughs> yeah, you know? the earth swallowed him up. That means Korach bad. But I, I think what he asked, uh, Moses has validity to it. But I well, think I, I've I've actually heard. I I, I think it was a Rebbe Sikha, just speaking of about, about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He actually says that he'll he'll be the high priest in the third temple. Well, there you go. How's he doing? Oh, flipping yeah. it around. Be the, flipping it around. Yeah. Will be. Korak, Korak is gonna be the high priest in the third. Yeah, temple, yeah. You know? Kor he Korak's well, gonna get his wish. like eating pork in the world to come. Uh, you know, I guess. <laughs> the rabbis <laughs> teach that yeah. God's gonna give uh, Chazer the missing component. It, the uh, the good is bad, and the bad is good. What God hates the most amongst the Jewish people is an attempt to disorganize religion. That's really what Korach was trying to do. This mm, notion, yeah. like, who are you to think you're better than us? We're all special. So going against the flow, I mean, clearly God chose Moses. That's the basis of our religion. So to assume that God chose all of us, it's not necessarily true. God didn't didn't choose the Jewish people. God gave him the opportunity to leave because of what's called chutavot, because of the merits of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God gave them an opportunity to leave. And the vast majority of them, according to the rabbis, stayed behind in Egypt, and actually more of the mixed multitude left than yeah. ethnic Hebrews. I don't see where this chosenness, like where the notion of Bahar comes to place, of chosenness for no reason. It mm -hmm. seems like Jews, if they choose to, to be chosen, are appointed for a purpose. Now, the Zohar actually makes a statement. The Zohar says that it was... Abraham who chose God and not God who chose Abraham. And that actually makes sense because why would you choose someone blindly and then test them heavily to make sure if they were worthy? Then he wasn't just chosen for anything. No, he was picked and then tested. So it's really because Abraham chose to go through these tests. It was Abraham doing the choosing here. Abraham could have just said, no, I don't want. But the understanding is that God chooses everybody. This is why the rabbis teach that before he came to Abraham, God offered the Torah to the other nations. The understanding yeah. of the nations means the fathers of the other nations. But they didn't want it. But Abraham heard God's voice, picked up and went where God wanted him to go. So because Abraham listened and acted, then he became the father of our faith. Not that God chose the Jewish people blindly. As a matter of fact, to quote Dennis Prager, someone mentioned Dennis Prager here, he says that he believes that the reason God chose the Jewish people was because of all the problems they had, because they were such a stiff-necked people, because they were so stubborn, to tell the world that if he could use these bunch of hooligans, that he could use and help anybody, that if he could do it for them, he could do it for us. And that makes perfect sense. Just think about the Jewish people today. 10% of the Jewish population is religious or observant from an orthodox perspective. 54%, according to simpletoremember.com, consider themselves atheists. And the rest, they're amcha, they're agnostics, they don't really know where they belong, they're unaffiliated. That's not a very impressive bunch 
to be people who are part of God. I mean, this is what the Tanya teaches. It says, that every Jew is a part of God, mamash, like an actual part of God. That if they do good, they're good. And if they do bad, they're good. That they have a pintle yid and they have a Yiddish and a Shama and they're so special. That's not what the Torah is telling us. The Torah is showing us a people who don't learn and who, who keep getting it wrong. But it seems that the reason he's doing it and he allows for this message to be disseminated amongst the masses is to say, like, you know what? I chose them. Just imagine what I could do with you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's how we should view it. And that would actually make more converts. I mean, I'm all for the ethnicizing Judaism and proselytizing hardcore to wash out the bad blood. This whole notion that, oh, if you're ethnically Jewish and you're special, nonsense. If you keep poor, you're special. And this is not something I'm saying. This is what the Ramam says. This is what the Talmud says. There are other books that say that differently, like the Kuzari and the Zohar. Fine. But the earlier sources reiterate the message as in the Torah, that if you keep my mitzvot, then you'll be my amsagula, my treasured people. But if, if you keep my mitzvot, it's always conditional. It's not that a Jew is a Jew is a Jew and he's special. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? It makes God look stupid to assume that he elevates blood over ethics. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But doesn't a Amalek also come from Yitzhak? And isn't Yitzhak the child of the covenant? I mean, come on, guys. There's a disconnect. But doesn't Edom and Esau also come from Yitzhak? But I'm the heretic. Yeah. I guess you could say the Korok's Rebellion was the original BLM movement. I don't know the uh, connection uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I don't uh, know the connection there. I was trying to be funny there. Okay, someone asked, <laughs> is, it, is, it, <laughs> is it binding according anarchist. to Halak? Yeah, anarchist. Definitely the Antifa. Yeah, right, Antifa for oh, sure. Okay, Antifa. That's right. it. Okay, sure. All right, guys, let's change the subject. We're going to offend, yeah, offend people. Yeah, it's controversial. Is it binding according to Halakha? 